Now, like most attempts to distill the British idea, I suspect I will fail you this afternoon. And that's not for lack of trying, but because in a modern, democratic society like ours, national identity is not static or stagnant, but alive. In order to conserve a settled identity, never without an answer to the question, who are we? National identity must gradually but constantly respond to change, as we all do. Britain is a diverse nation, and this is often used to argue that long-standing traditions and institutions, often associated with a more homogenous era, must cease and surrender. But I'm not so sure that's true. Take the coronation of King Charles, however mysterious, parochial, or at times absurd the whole thing was, by some inner prompting, many, many people from different backgrounds chose to participate in some way. And occasions like this are both purely symbolic and yet of an order, by which I mean it's somehow gratifying to the soul, congruous for social beings like us to participate in a bigger collective community despite bizarre cultural idiosyncrasies. Seeing as this is the National Conservative Conference, you might expect some uh, indulgent lefty bashing over the next 10 minutes or so, but I will critique their attempt to distill the British idea before commending the Conservative instinct, but not for some snobbish an obnoxious, nostalgic obsession with the past, but for the common good of the nation, past, present, and future. So, the greatest failure to distill the British idea is won by the Liberals. Today we find them on both left and right, but the left are especially desperate to eschew national symbols, rituals, and other first-hand experiences of British culture. In fact, they eschew anything particularly national, things once venerated by popular culture and a source of pride for many. One broadcaster recently su suggested we paint a new English flag. I don't wholly object to the idea, but what should it depict, reflect or symbolise? Because we need an answer to this question. Without any appeal to particularities, the left grab at abstract ideas like tolerance or freedom. British values, they're apparently called. And they're nice words, but how motivating are these words alone? Don't they strike inwards, if not directed towards some end? Be tolerant, but to whom precisely? Be free, but how? This liberal computer science approach to national identity, the attempt to link citizens together before fostering the first person plural, we will fail. We the people, goes the American Constitution, a self-consciously connected people even before any legal terms were constituted. There is a hermeneutic problem with forcing abstract concepts like freedom into some concrete code like British values without reference to the training ground of civil society. Now the right, Edmund Burke, he's very welcome here, isn't he? He wrote about little platoons located, situated, embodied association with others in a particular place and at a particular time. And this is where we are confronted with other living people, those with whom we have to navigate our presence, and where goods like freedom can be interpreted and understood, practiced and perfected. Where we can co-create bonds of trust with others so that we can be free. And since we are culturally rooted beings, our interactions with one another are mediated or carried by a cultural ecosystem of shared habits, norms, and customs in our families and communities and towards an expression of some settled national identity. In a way, a meaningful national identity 
does not need to be grasped. It can find us in the half-light of ritual at the street party or in Evensong. That said, a word of caution to the right. The left heap ridicule on the right for being nostalgic, even idolatrous in vain efforts to capture the British idea in reified substitutes for some sacred thing. And they're right, of course. National symbols are not immutable. They're cultural and they're human. But if the left are guilty of computer science connection, I have two words for the right. Pomp pornography. What do I mean? Well, pornography provides a shortcut to sexual gratification. It excites the sexual imagination without the thing itself. It uses the image of another person, often defaced, to elicit pleasure without any relationship and therefore without any recourse to show honour, dignity or love. Flags or other su such totems can be pornified, used inappropriately or even perversely to serve a purpose other than co-creating bonds of trust between people in a place. This is pomp porn. Hope you like it. And undoubtedly, many engage with the coronation in a pornographic way. What was the display of all that regalia for? If the spurs, sword, armels, robe and stole, the orb, ring, glove, the scepter and rod, and the crown, and the millions in taxpayers' money, was purely a show of pompous power, there are probably cheaper ways of going about it. Despite the fact that it's no secret that constitutional monarchy does not really have any useful administrative function at all, that great British moment was meaningful. Still, His Majesty's subjects cry, as Nina did in her excellent piece for Compact magazine, long live King Charles III, the dutiful sovereign of the great nothing. But much like sex, actually, the point of the coronation is love or covenant. Our nearly naked king, in an act of frankly submission, promised to serve his subjects. Then, reciprocated, came the royal ring, scepter, and rod, as the liturgy puts it, a symbol of covenant. If you think about it, the coronation was a wedding of sorts between king and people. In an ostensibly religious ceremony, our monarch, a temporal institution embodied by a man, covenanted. Charles Philip Arthur George received the old order and promised to renew it, to, quote, govern the peoples of the realms and territories according to their respective laws and customs. The covenant preceded him and will survive him, but for a short time, he will uphold it. Now, of course, the constitutional monarchy is not keeping this country together, not really. We will survive a royal interregnum again, but this does not make it meaningless. Tens of thousands of people, almost spellbound, stood in the rain for hours on end, jostling umbrellas in a typically British passive-aggressive way, surely not just for Zadok the priest. Instead, whether by oath, or just by being there, people came to lend some loyalty to one another by communing with the king. The coronation was, of course, a picture of how we all live day to day, really. Because we are all covenanting beings. We're born to die with the space in between also destined by compelling rituals in the empirical world of our relationships. Rituals that form us into something towards being. We become happy, safe, and free people by drawing nutrients, social, economic, spiritual perhaps, from our families and communities. And I can't put this better than the philosopher Alistair McIntyre, who said this, it is only because human beings have an end toward which they are directed by reason of their specific nature that practices, traditions, and the like are able to function as they do. So I discovered that I had, without realizing it, presupposed the truth of something very close to the account of the concept of good." End quote. 
We, people, are covenantal, and so we are ritualists. So it's neither by computer science nor by pump horn that we can arrive at a covenanting national community. Instead, we must use ritual to successfully respond to the instinct in many of us to freely choose participation or identification in order to pursue and enjoy the common good. This is how we are to understand the otherwise utter meaninglessness of a sunny season of bat and ball on the lawn and other such great British rituals. The late, great Roger Scruton wrote that the rational being will see through them, but nevertheless respect them. We respect them because the purpose of our customary habits and sometimes liturgical or ceremonial life does not just serve some British fantasy or commercial interests dressed up as heritage. Truly, to agree that some offering or gesture to love the people of this place by identifying with a collective community is a mutually beneficial, comforting even, act of both solidarity and self-preservation. This, after all, is what national identity is for. Sociologist Philip Reef said this, in every culture there stands a censor, governing the opportunities of recognizing and responding to novel stimuli. He also said that no culture has ever preserved itself without a sacred order, but this is perhaps for another time. In other words, we need some authoritative, settled consensus, living, not static, mediating, not imposing. This will help us to discern, as a nation, how to respond to change. So, as promised, I have failed to distill the British idea. I did almost say it's King Charles, but really he, like the cricket bat, is once loved, battered and passed on. I do think, however, we can see that the conservative instinct can more successfully sustain practices, traditions and the like that direct people towards some common good. Meanwhile, I think we've already seen the failure of the liberal worldview. Identity politics simply does not make sense of the covenanting, ritualistic lives that we all live, and it has chased virtue out of the public square. The idea that autonomous individuals can be reduced to commodities, a menu of characteristics, and that it's for bureaucrats to manage how we navigate our differences. So emaciated are our moral muscles now, we think some abstract set of British values or even just more laws can govern us out of riven relationships between people. So we need a sense of ourselves, a sense of we, national identity, neither silly and superfluous nor immutably sacred neither computer science nor pomp pornography. The idea of national identity, built on ritual, supports us as people to go forward together. So, go forth and covenant in families and communities. Allow the coronation to captivate your imagination and patronize the nation. Thank you.